Welcome to the new series of Speak Up, the television and social media platform for Freemasonry in New Zealand. I am Barry Rushton, your host, and thank you for joining us this evening. My first guest tonight is all the way from the UK, Worshipful Brother Dr. Mike Kearsley, who is about midway on an Australasian speaking tour sponsored by the Australian and New Zealand Masonic Research Council. If he comes to a town near you, then gather your friends to see him. His talks are enthralling, entertaining and engaging. I cannot speak highly enough of Dr. Mike Kearsley. Following the doctor is a young fellow, another recipient of the Freemasons University Scholarship. It's Jack Woodbury from Victoria University. Now and again, travelling around the country, you'll find great Masonic buildings. Our regular contributor, Graham Houston, has found one such building at the bottom of New Zealand. It's the Invercargill Masonic Building, and he's here tonight to tell us all about it. I am privileged tonight to introduce my first guest, Worshipful Brother Mike Kearsley. Dr. Mike, it is great to see you. Thank you, Barry. Thank all, you for inviting me. All the way from the UK. All the way from sunny UK. Sunny UK. <laughs> it is a privilege to have you here, and thanks for being with us tonight. Now, I know, for the viewers will not know this, but I do, that you're in the middle of an Australasian tour, a lecture tour, which sounds fantastic, right? I hear that it's going great. Well, people are telling me that they're enjoying it, which is really good, you know. Where did it start? It started in Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, Hong Kong. Then I did all the centres in Australia and Tasmania, came over to New Zealand, and the intention was to do the whole of New Zealand, but my wife became a little unwell, so we held back for a few weeks, and I've done most of the North Island now, and I'll be doing the South Island just after Christmas. So now the speaking tour, that's actually <laughs> yes. uh, sponsored by the Australian New Zealand Masonic Research Council, correct? It is. So tell me why, why they do that, and what, what's the whole thing about Okay, the, that ANZMRC is the uh, union, if you wish, of all of the research lodges right. in in Australia, New Zealand and the Far East. And what they do is every two years they have a conference. Last year was Melbourne, next year is Dunedin. But in between they invite a guest speaker to tour the area and they hope that it'll be entertaining. And part of that is that you provide a book and you have all sorts of uh, uh, chapters and presentations in it and the lodges choose whichever presentation they want. So that's what it's about. Which is fantastic. Now, we'll come on to that book in very okay. shortly. Yeah. Just for the viewer's sake, you were born in the UK, yeah. came to New Zealand, yeah. and you started your Masonic career in a lodge in New Zealand. Correct? I did, in Hawara. Hawara. Number 34. I know. I know Hawara <laughs> well. Just down yeah. from New Plymouth where yep. I used to live a bit. Yep. Now, you um, also, too, then you went back to England, right? And you yep. did a doctorate back there. I did. And believe, I believe you joined a, a musical lodge. I did. Right there. That must have been fun. It was. Um, in fact, I was playing in a band, I'm sure we'll talk about that, <laughs> and one of the guys in the band, uh, well, two of them actually were Masons, but they said, oh, we're in a lodge that you might be interested in. It's a musician's lodge. And what we do is we meet on a Saturday, um, we open and close the lodge as quickly as we possibly can, <laughs> then we go and join our wives and friends and we have a concert for an hour. And then we have lunch. And I said, this sounds like my <laughs> kind of lodge. Uh, and I joined it and of course the rest is history. I, it was the tip of the iceberg, as you can imagine. And I got more and more and more involved. Now, you've always been involved in, or interested in history, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, always, always. All, all the time. Mm. And um, I believe over time that you, you joined the preeminent research lodge in the UK? Yes. Which is... Uh, Quattro Coronati. That's a beauty. If you can say it, you're Num in. Number 2076, <laughs> I'll put that bit in. Right. Which is, which is, <laughs> yes. And in 2011, you were awarded the Norman Spencer yes. uh, Award, right? Yes. That was before they invited me to join. join. It interested me. And then I thought, well, why don't I put a paper in? And which I did for the Norman Spencer Prize, and I won it. And so then afterwards they sort of said, well, you're a likely lad and you're keen and you obviously like writing things. Why don't you think about joining? So which I said, yes, sir. that'd be lovely. Thank you. Now, the thing that's quite intriguing is that the paper that you put in, I think, was the history of, of Grand Lodge in New Zealand. Formation of the Grand Lodge in New Zealand. Formation of the Grand Lodge in New Zealand. Formation of the Grand Lodge in New Zealand. Tell us why you actually thought that you, that would be a good topic. To well, put because in. I'd come from New Zealand, oh, that's so I had given. sort of experience of New Zealand lodges, and I thought it was different. Okay. And it, it, it's actually an interesting story. It's called uh, an exercise in brotherly love or lack of it. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, three warring well, they became warring grand lodges: English, Irish, and Scottish, operating in New Zealand 
who then decide, well, wouldn't it be better if we are all one Grand Lodge of New Zealand? What a good idea. Well, it wasn't quite so easy to achieve. And there still are those um, constitutions in yeah, New Zealand. So we moved I mean, to four. Uh, so yeah, instead of having yeah, yeah, three, yeah, exactly. they moved to four. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. that's, that is true. Still the case. In 2014, uh, again, you were awarded the Prestonian yes. uh, lectureship. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. That in itself is a, a one-time event. You, yeah. can only, only mm. win it one, you can only do it once, once, right? And in that time, you present papers or you write a number of papers or you present on behalf of the Lodge? Right. What happens is it, it, um, it's a commemoration, if you wish, of William Preston, yeah. who was a bit of a bad boy. Yes, to be I'm I'm anyway, but never mind. Um, and what they do is he left some money 300 guineas, mm -hmm. actually, uh, to be paid to any well-skilled mason who would create a lecture, and each year they would choose one person to be the Prestonian lecturer, give him a nice little badge, and he would go around presenting his lecture. Uh, by the way, none of the Prestonian lecturers have ever seen any of the money. Oh, the three never seen any of it. There's a surprise. <laughs> um, but um, it's probably building up in some. It's building somewhere. up. Yes, exactly right. The interest is building. So uh, each year they choose a different person. And 2014, I was fortunate that they said, "Well, we'll have you." And uh, it's quite a challenge. I did 45 lectures throughout the world in my year. Not only a challenge, I'm sure, but a, what a great honour, what oh, a great award. Fantastic. 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 Now, I think it's the effort involved with preparing things goes along with the fact that in 2013 you became the editor of the, uh, a quarterly magazine from England called, called The Square. The Square. We'll, we'll, get a, we'll get a copy of that like that. Yes. Um, and I believe there's even a picture yes. of you as editor Yes, here. that wasn't one of mine. No, that but wasn't. I think you've got that, one of mine. But that certainly is a picture of you. We'll come <laughs> up on that shortly. Oh, yeah. So that in itself has got to be a huge accomplishment. I mean, to, to, and I've looked through these magazines and they're full of articles. To try and pull that together mm. every three months is a big job, yes. right? And you did that for four years. Four years. Uh, four times a year, a year four years. Uh, people pay to get this magazine. It's the only independent magazine for English Masons. It goes worldwide. So you have to sit back and say, what are they interested in? Yeah. What would they be interested in Boise, Idaho? It yeah, may yeah, be, you yeah. know, and, and Bombay, and try to have a range of interesting articles. And what I, what I wanted it to be was not what the Americans call grip and grin, you know, charity collections, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, people being yeah, nominated yeah. for awards and all yeah. the names. I wanted something that was a little bit challenging. challenging. Yes. Yeah. And so I purposely put things in which I hope would, you know, initiate discussion. <coughs> controversy. And I think I, I sort of achieved that. <laughs> now, I believe the new editor, am I correct, or I may be one after you as well, is a, is a lady? Correct? Yes, Philippa. Philippa. Philippa Fawkes, as was, is now Philippa Lee, and she's taking it over. So she's doing very well. Now, we know that you being in New Zealand, you are doing this the lecture tour. Yep. And, and with that goes this lovely book that you've actually put together, of Thank course, called The Square, yes. On the Square, rather. Yes. And in here, of course, are the 12 lectures that you will give, depending on which the Lodge wants. Right? Yes. They are all one of the ones that I've, I've seen, and I was lucky enough to be at, at one of your lectures last night, which I'll talk about in a second. Yeah. But of the 12 that are there, is there, are there, are there a couple that are you know, more favourites than the yes, other? Yes, of course. Um, the two most popular ones would be, firstly, the one that you saw yourself last night, which is the Roberta Calvi, that the man hanging under Blackfriars oh, Bridge. Just a fantastic yeah. story. Was it the Mafia? Was it the Masons? Or was it the Vatican? <laughs> question mark, What question done mark. him in? Yeah. Uh, and the other is actually the Prestonian itself, which is the first year of the, Grand, of the United Grand Lodge of England. Two warring Masonic committees arch enemies for 60 years, forced to come together in committee and form a union, which they didn't want. <laughs> so it had some interesting uh, events going on. Mike, last night in the Roberto Calvi uh, presentation you gave, of course, there's, there's always mystique and a bit of sort sure. of interest in subterfuge potential and conspiracy theories. Talking about um, what a lot of people in the public have seen, of course, is the Dan Brown the movies and books sure. and things like that. Yeah. What do you think your whole take is on all that? Um, you know, I, mean, I know it's uh, an interesting little story, but how do you feel about that? Sort of well, thing? it's very interesting, and it links in, uh, it links in very well. Um, a friend of mine was Michael Bajant, mm. who actually was very active in creating the oration scheme in England with uh, uh, Spenny Northampton. 
And of course, it was Michael who wrote the book, The Holy Blood and the Holy, Holy Grail. Grail. Do you remember that? Yes, indeed. And then when Dan Brown came out with his book, The Da Vinci Code, Michael said, he's pinched all my ideas from my book, and he sued Dan Brown. Uh, a huge mistake. It cost him everything. Uh, and eventually, it cost him his health and his life, I think. So it was, it was very, very sad. Um, I think Dan Brown realized these are good stories, and it will make a very good novel, you know, once you mm -hmm. twist it a little bit. I think quite a few people probably think that Dan Brown hasn't got a very high opinion of Freemasonry. You know, we're all assassins and <laughs> satanic plots and goodness knows whatever. So the interesting thing is that he was invited to present to the Scottish Rite southern jurisdiction in the United States. And he couldn't make it because he had another book, The Lost Symbol, coming out. He wrote a very, very interesting letter in which he said he was sorry he couldn't make it, but he wanted them to know how high, how highly he regarded Freemasonry, how men of different cultures and backgrounds and faiths could come together and break bread in brotherly love and harmony, and he wished us all very, very well. And then when he came to England to be interviewed about his books, guess where he was interviewed? <laughs> no, don't tell me. In Freemasons is, Hall is that a on fact? Great Queen Street. Far out. Yes. So uh, that was very, very interesting. But, you know, like a lot of people, he knows that all of this stuff sells. Yeah. It sounds good. Well, we had a guest on at the beginning of the series, the second series, and um, a new Freemason. And his semi-basic introduction to Freemasonry was through one of Dan Brown's books because right. he was intrigued anyway. And then when he started reading that, he thought, oh, maybe there's a bit more to it. And then, of course, you know, you, you won't necessarily find the truth in the Dan Brown book, but no. it led him at least no. to saying, okay, what's this Freemasonry yes. all about? Yeah. And so consequently, he is and will become uh, a far better Freemason than a man yeah. because of a little kickstart yeah. from a book like that, yes. you know. To in be clear, sorry, go on. No, no, go. Well, to be clear, all of this nonsense that's talked about Freemasonry really comes from the 1920s and 30s, from the time of the dictators in Europe. Yeah, yeah and they were against Freemasonry. Well, wouldn't you be? You don't want middle-class men who are influential. <laughs> thinking for themselves. Meet, right? Yeah, thinking for themselves and meeting behind a closed door, you know, yeah, yeah. Like whatever. So they suppressed Freemasonry, and they made up the most outrageous stories about Freemasonry, sex magic, satanic rites, goodness knows what. And we, in response to that, went into total secrecy. Yeah. Got rid of all of the membership lists and all of that kind of thing. And it's taken us years to come out of that. Yes. And in the meantime, all of these stories of all the terrible things that we're supposed to do still persist. But I hope slowly it's being washed away. That is quite so, isn't it? Once, mm. the, once the blanket sort of covering goes over you, to dig that, dig yourself out of that for mm. no great reason Absolutely. takes forever and forever. Absolutely. Yeah, wonderful. Well, as I said at the beginning, that uh, I knew you were coming on today, and so I knew you were speaking last night at United Masters, which I think will probably be your New Zealand Lodge I I'm picking. You know, yes, That's right. the one that I'm sure that you'll gravitate towards. Right. 167. They're pretty desperate. Well, they're good folks. <laughs> Not really. And I was in the audience, and I was enthralled about that story. Oh, so, thank you. And that's just one of 12, and I... I am certainly going to read the others. And Thank any you. of the Freemasons watching the show, I will really urge you at some stage, and we'll put the website up towards the end, Thanks. that to actually purchase this book because mm. it's very reasonable cost-wise and extremely, extremely interesting, yes. to be frank. Now, you're heading back to the South Island again soon. I you? am. I think, which is great. Good. I didn't actually want to can, I, can I just say, Barry, yeah, of the go. book, yeah. not everything in the book people will agree with. Some things in the book people might be a bit shocked about. My intention was not to be destructive or shock people, but to initiate discussion. Great. And, uh, and that's the purpose. I, I say in the book, it doesn't bother me if people disagree, strongly disagree. Mike, you know, you're a dead man. Yeah. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I will be upset if they're bored. Oh, very good. And I don't think it's a, they're, they're boring stories. Now, I know that as you go around these uh, tours, I won't say necessarily in New Zealand, but overseas, you, you're really also quite passionate about a particular charity that I don't know oh, yeah. if some of this money goes to it as well or not. No. But it is a, a great charity, I believe. It's called DEBRA. DEBRA. And for those who look it up, and I'll try and get this out if I can, it's dystrophic uh, epidemi epidemolysis bullosa. That's near enough. That's pretty close, yes. right? Research, Research Association, Association, right? It's a, it is a terrible sort of yes. disease, isn't it? And, and one, one, it's where the, the linings of the, of the body tend the to The skin separate. doesn't work. Yeah, it just doesn't work. And people can turn over in bed and Your skin's tear bleeding, and, falling off, and, and hours of bandaging. And it can attack any family. Which, From, we know history of it, and the child is born with this pain, 
uh, suffering and of course as they get older there's a mental I worth of scarring and so on. It's dreadful, absolutely dreadful. So please forgive me for asking this but was there any anybody close to you no. that had, no? Not at okay. all. So how did you find this amongst the mur mur So many charities. When I would do presentations, I would ask people in the lodge, are there any particular charities that you are supporting? Because I'm happy to support it. Mm. And uh, somebody came up, I don't even, can't even remember who it was, but somebody came up one day and said, have you heard of Deborah? I said, no, I've never heard of it. Gave me, a, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> gave me a brochure <laughs> on it. They were obviously involved with it. And I read the brochure and it was appalling. I thought, this is truly dreadful. Mm. I'd never heard of it. And then Same when here. I did the Prestonian, I wanted a charity that, was ex that you could use worldwide. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just for Middlesex or mm -hmm. England, you know, or whatever. And it ticks all the boxes. Children, worldwide, can attack anybody. And uh, so I thought it was a really, really good charity. And when I checked, the patron was Sophie, Countess of Wessex. Wow. And the president was Michael Portillo when he's not on a train somewhere in Europe. And I thought, well, you know, it's well supported. It's it's kosher, you know, if I can. Well, I think it's, I think it's uh, like all charities. It's it's worthwhile for sure. Yeah. Well, we really, really wish you the best for the rest of your tour down there. And it's been such a pleasure having you a on the show and b to be uh, for me to be in the audience. And I, I strongly urge uh, any Freemasons uh, watching to, and we'll put up the website in a second Thank on you. how to get the book because I just know they will enjoy it. As you say, there will be discussion points on there that they might say, well, but at least it makes them think. You know, I and, hope so. um, and it's a very entertaining read, the one that I that I read last night when I got home. There will be a test. <laughs> I'll be ready for it. <laughs> Thanks again, Mike. Thank Dr. you, Dr. Mike. Thank you for inviting me. Well, it's our pleasure indeed. Thank, Thank you for your support. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce to you another recipient of the Freemason Scholarship Award. Jack Woodbury, all the way from Victoria, Wellington, and it's good to see you, mate. Nice to see you too, thank you. Now tell me, um, the award, Freemasons Award, any Freemasons in your family at all? Or? No, no. No, just all? So they came out, you applied for the scholarship, yeah. they looked at what you were doing, and they said, this guy's worthy of $10,000. Which is incredibly generous. Did you have a big party? <laughs> <laughs> Was there anything, no, I've been, I've, 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 I've been responsible, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's really wonderful to have that kind of support. Uh, from an organisation, particularly considering I'm studying arts, which is, uh, yeah, yeah, as, yeah. as some people tend to, to think about it, not exactly an economically uh, wise decision. Uh, so it's great to have the support of And so uh, apart from the obvious, do you, the, 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 the actual the scholarship itself helps you with your fees or just helps you survive? And uh, it's, it's buys mostly, you equipment to do? Mostly for equipment and great. resources and that sort great, of thing. Great, um, great. The, part of the irony with, with working with sound is that um, you don't make a hell of a lot of money, especially mm -hmm. at university, uh, and then all the gear is super expensive. So it's mm -hmm. kind of uh, bad on both sides of that equation. But, um, <laughs> you see, you're talking to a, a baby boomer, yes. a guy who grew up the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, you know. And I have gone on to the the Vimeo, 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 Vimeo yeah. on and looked at the uh, looked at what you had produced. It's called uh, a Tree Falls. Yes, yes. Um, and it's it's look to be frank, uh, it was very comp it was very confusing to me. You know, I can't, I sort of can't quite get into it. W what's happening? What are you doing there? Yeah, so it's sort of a, a distillation of a number of ideas that I've been working with uh, sort of since the start of my undergraduate studies at Vic, really. Um, and it, it comes out of a little bit of frustration to some extent. Uh, so I'd be developing these uh, I guess art music pieces. Yeah. Uh, and occasionally it would be for uh, slightly more complex uh, sort of presentation formats. So normally when you listen to music, you've got headphones, or you've got a pair of speakers, and they sort of just put music onto you. But I've been working with things like octophonic arrays, which are sort of eight speakers around you in a, in a circle. And these sorts of things achieve the same sort of immersive audio experience as, say, a surround sound system for a home theatre, for example. Yeah, yeah. You sort of sit in the environment, if you will. Uh, and I remember my dad uh, asking me, oh, can I listen to one of your pieces? And I go, oh, yeah, sure. And I'd send him a link, and so he could download it and listen to it. And then he, uh, he, <laughs> he just played it on his phone speaker, um, oh, which, yeah, which yeah, is, yeah, which yeah, is okay. fine, and it's entirely reasonable to do so. But uh, it kind of uh, ruins the experience to some extent. Yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. It's sort of a, a filter that I can't quite get past, if you will, as yeah, someone yeah. just sort of deciding to, to, to do something with the piece that is not really uh, to do with my intent for it. Uh, so this was sort of sitting in the back of my mind and I was thinking about this and, and I realised that to some extent uh, it's kind of like a filter, if you will. The audience is a bit of a filter 
Uh, so you can, you can spend as long as you want making a piece of music and developing it and perfecting it and whether or not it's an electronic piece that you press play on or whether or not it's a piece for orchestra that you uh, have performed in a concert, uh, the way the audience feels, where they sit, uh, what they mm -hmm. think about the particular genre of music, you can't determine. And so it kind of takes the control away from you to some extent. So with that in mind, what a tree falls <laughs> is doing is uh, essentially trying to make that audible. So uh, taking the influence of the audience yeah. and, and making it heard, if you will. So the way that plays out is I use uh, basically a little box with ultrasonic sensors in it and don't worry about what exactly they do, but essentially yeah. they, uh, they determine whether or not an audience member is there. And then if an audience member is there, the composition reacts in real time and Which says, hey, an audience member's here, and it starts breaking the piece apart. See, that's so... It seems so complex to me. I mean, it's. I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, I saw that on the on the Vimeo. Mm -hmm. I, I saw you set up four speakers, and you had the big round, the big yes, round. Yeah, this a, is the thing you're talking about, right? Box interface box, right? Sensors, yeah. And then you had something playing, and then you sort of came into the field, right? That's correct. Yeah. And it, then it changes the mm -hmm. way the music uh, happens. Yeah, yeah. So, so as I'm sort of talking about that that notion of the audience being somewhat destructive in their yeah. impact on a piece, uh, that sort of plays out audibly, if you will. So as you step in, the, the composition glitches. So the, the channels start turning off and on, and uh, you start getting loud pops and bangs, and the pace slows down and speeds up you know, four oh. or five times within about a millisecond, and then so on and so forth. And so basically, it's tying that gesture of trying to hear a piece, the audience trying to hear a piece, to the audience breaking a piece, if you will. Incredible. You see, it's <laughs> baby boomers like me. You know? yeah. I mean, I've got this great place where I sit on the deck. You know, yeah. I'm on my deck, and I've got two speakers up there and a bass speaker there, and mm -hmm. I position myself, and I am in heaven with that combination. <laughs> you know, and I'll play stuff, and I just love it. You know, mine seems so simple. My concept compared to where you're going and yours. But that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, no, I, it's a great um, thing. You know, I on, on my way here, I, I had little earbuds and terrible quality earbuds listening to music. And I think that's just the, the beauty of music is that you can go from listening to something on earbuds to going overseas to Europe and seeing like the beast array of speakers, which is this massive uh, sort of roof of speakers with hundreds of um, yeah, 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 channels yeah, yeah. of audio. And it's, you know, but now, music's just like that. Well, Jack, we really wish you the best with your, Cheers, with your career, you. mate, and good on you. I think, you know, your dad and I would sort of join a little covers band and have just as much fun, I think, you know what I mean? But I think it's I'd great having it, yeah. you here, and all the best, and Cheers. congratulations again on the scholarship. Thank you. Thank you. And closing out the show tonight, of course, is our regular contributor, Graham Houston. In the Masonic world, there's a review going on with buildings, especially even our iconic buildings, unfortunately. Graham, you're going to talk about one great iconic building tonight, I believe, right? Good to see you, mate. Thank you, Barry. Good on Thank you. you. Yes, I want to talk to you about what's happening with buildings throughout New Zealand at the moment. Now, the Freemasons throughout New Zealand have historically have either owned their own yeah. buildings in their own right or partnered up with other, another lodge to share the ownerships of a building. And that's just been a rite of passage. Yeah. What's happened with the demographic movement in New Zealand of population, that what were once thriving towns, and if you take Coromandel as an example, which had a very good fishing, mining and uh, forestry unit, good population, suddenly it died and populations moved, which meant the building still existed but with fewer people to yeah. operate it and maintain it. That's happened a lot. The requirements of uh, younger people today that are joining the lodge is not the same for lodge ownership, it's just somewhere to meet and they put their effort into the community yeah. more so. Many of these buildings have become underutilised but have high maintenance costs. The earthquake in Christchurch was a big wake up call. Monster. Because we own properties, or the lodges own properties, not as real estate investors, but as places to hold their lodge meetings. And so the review, increased insurance premiums, high structural costs to earthquake strengthen the, the buildings, high insurance premiums, fewer members, outlying areas meant the buildings would become too expensive to maintain. And that just doesn't include the ordinary building, it includes some of our iconic buildings. And that's one of the ones I want to tell you about. The iconic Masonic Hall in 4th Street in Vicargo, down in Southland. To me, it's one of the best buildings <laughs> of a Masonic building in New Zealand. I think one you of like the finest. it, Graham. I think you I like, like it. it. It's a statement building. It states what the Masonic fraternity is about. Take a look at the columns in the front yeah. of the building there, of the Doric order. 
significant to Masons. Take a look at the steps that lead up to the building. Significant, significant to, to Masons. Unfortunately, times have changed, yeah. and for 94 years, that building has been part of Masonic in history in New Zealand. But from 2020, it will no longer be so. It will be sold. Now, this building has a heritage, a Category 1 heritage order placed on it in 1984 because of its significance. It sits on a raised site in Invercargill. It is very much right in the middle of the CBD. It's the site of the Southland markets on a Sunday morning and has been for a long time. Wedding venues, show venues, conferences, it's used for that as well. It is just a landmark. And I've always believed it's the right <laughs> building, but it's in the wrong town. I know it's in Vicargo and it's yours, but it should be in a Wellington or a Christchurch or an Auckland, a bigger place, so we can make a statement about what we're about. And that's the sad thing that probably that came out of the earthquake okay. review in Christchurch was that Masons can no longer afford to maintain such big okay. buildings around. The movement is towards centres where a number of lodges meet, people are mobile enough and people can move to and that from. That makes sense too, doesn't it? I mean, it, it makes it easier on the members, they can have a commercial arm, they can, you know, they can help pay for their building costs and rates and all that stuff. It certainly makes sense. Well, that's right. And although the Masonic Hall does receive income from some of these ventures I just talked about, it is not substantial enough never to been. cover it. And it will never but will be. And so the buildings today need to have a retail uh, income stream or a, some sort of rental income stream in order to justify the cost. It's just a great, a great never iconic been. statement building and it'll be a very sad loss to Freemasonry, but it will never ever be not a part of Freemasonry. It's been part of New Zealand. It's time to move on. The Masonic building will always be there, no matter who owns it. It'll always be recognised as it is, it was, it will continue to be and have great significance for Masons in New Zealand. And what's more, in Invercargill will still know it yeah, as the Masonic, Masonic building, the building in Invercargill. It's iconic, it's a heritage building, so it will always be there. Mate, we'll do Arrowtown and Queenstown next Arrow time. Arrowtown's okay? great. Thank I need you, to go there to see that one. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. Terrific. Well, that's our show for this week. Don't forget, if you'd like to know more about Freemasonry, and you won't find it in a Dan Brown's book, but you will by going to the Grand Lodge website, which is freemasonsnz.org. In the meantime, if you've been thinking, planning, or asking questions about joining Freemasonry, we have a website for this very purpose. It's simply welcome to freemasonry.co.nz. We hold a regular dinner experience where you can meet other Freemasons before making a decision to join. So once again, thanks for joining us. See you next week.